Hi, welcome to the next edition of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. And I'm Brittany. This week, our uh, health topic is going to be bladder stones in dogs. Mm -hmm. We talked a little bit about the black cat, and that covers a lot of the stones and crystals that cats get. But dogs are a little bit different. Yeah. Um, that's the reason. So we'll talk a little bit that in a, in a while. But first, I want to talk about a, a new product that's coming out that we're pretty excited here. Mm -hmm. This is the first all-in-one preventative tablet. So this is going to prevent your internal parasites, the heartworms and the intestinal parasites, okay. as well as your external parasites, fleas and ticks. Nice. All in one one monthly pill. Is it chewable? This is a chewable tablet. It's from nice. Zoetis. FDA just approved this. Um, so it's the first one to provide comprehensive protection against these most common parasites. Okay. Um, it's going to be approved for dogs eight weeks and older, which okay. is good because previously ProHeart, which we like from the same company, can't use in dogs less than six months. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's good for dogs 2.8 pounds and heavier. So that's going to okay. be most puppies. Um, so we should have that in late April. So as soon as that's available, we'll update everybody on that. Yeah. So uh, according to Chris Adolph, the, uh, one of the veterinarians for uh, Zoetis, comprehensive parasite protection is a critical component of every anim annual wellness exam. And veterinarians should strongly recommend year-round, broad-spectrum preventative for all patients. Um, Trio makes it easier for the dog owners to follow their veterinarian's recommendations for parasite protection because it covers the most common parasites in just one convenient chewable. Nice. We're going to see that the cost of this can be pretty comparable to doing ProHeart and Symperica. It's probably going to be a better deal for the uh, bigger dogs Yeah. Um, from what we're seeing. So, um, so if you're going to be giving a monthly flea pill and it's going to save you money than, than doing the ProHeart, it might be the way to go for them. Yeah. Um, for the smaller dogs, we might still go with the ProHeart and the Symperica just because uh, it'll be a little less cost, but it's nice that this company's coming out with this. As with all these tick preventatives, uh, they do recommend be using it in caution with dogs with seizures. Yeah. So we pretty much don't. Um, it's going to be, uh, we can begin this at any time of year, and it's going to be recommended for it's a monthly product for a year-round administration. Yeah, nice. So we do do the heartworm test uh, before we'll start them on if it's been more than a year. Um, if they haven't been on heartworm preventative, it's important we do that test six months later as well. Mm -hmm. uh, usually then we won't do the tick panel test, just the heartworm test, but um, and then after that, once a year should cover them. Yeah, nice. All right. Very exciting. What do you got there? Um, so we've got some new technology for our puppies and kittens. Um, so from Pet Cube Inc., um, it was formed by three friends in the Ukraine. Wow. Um, they came out with this really cool, uh, item to help pet lovers play with their dog and cats while they're not in the same room. Okay. Um, so the product is equipped with a camera, a speaker, Wi-Fi capability, and a laser pointer that can be controlled remotely through the smartphone or through a tablet. You know, I think I, I saw a video on this. The guy was just drawing on the screen of his phone, and the red dot was moving around. He's falling. See, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, so it, it allows you to talk to your pet. It allows you to play, especially if you have a cat to chase a laser pointer, or even right. if you have a dog that allows you to There are dogs chase that dog. like laser pointers. There are, there. yes. <laughs> um, so the idea for the Pet Cube was created by Alex uh, Niskin um, when his neighbors threatened to call the police over the amount of noise that his dog Rocky made while he was out, you know, out of the home. Yeah. Um, the box worked so effect uh, efficiently that all of Niskin's friends wanted to have one. Um, wildly successful on Kickstarter um, that brought in over two hundred and fifty one hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred fifty one thousand dollars. Two hundred fifty one. Let's yeah. do that over. Uh, it was wildly successful over on Kickstarter. The campaign actually brought in over $250,000 in less than 42 days. Wow. Yeah. That's a um, lot of pet cubes. <laughs> um, and the pet cubes only priced at about, you know, 200 bucks, so $199. Okay. Um, that's not too bad. You know, many pet owners will consider this price to be minor compared to the issue of most pet boredom. Right. Um, the pet cube has already been named one of the six finalists in the SF New Tech and the Mac World's six about to break contests. Um, the only downside is that it may just be a little too much fun, and you're not going to get any work done, even when you're not at home. <laughs> yeah, people sit there. What are you doing? <laughs> I'm just playing with my dog. You left me back up to take my break. So I think that's really cool. Um, it kind of reminds me of one that I've seen on Amazon, where you can talk to the pet and you uh -huh. can see them and you can throw them a treat right so instead of just a treat though this one you can actually play with them. well it's i just really cool. I, I like the story behind this that the guy invented this out of a need to keep the neighbors them. from getting them in trouble mm -hmm. and so uh, good luck to him and the, and the pet cube and hopefully we'll be seeing that around soon yeah all right, let's get on to our pet health topic. And uh, in bladder stones in dogs, we're going to see a lot of the same ones we see in cats. We're going to see the struvite stones. 
But in dogs, they, those seem to be more secondary to bacterial infections. So you get a type of bacteria to produce this uh, urease in the urine, and that promotes the formation of these stones. Yeah. Uh, calcium oxalate is also very frequent in, in the dogs. It's actually mm -hmm. increased in frequency in the last 20 years. Uh, it's become one of the more, pop more frequent ones than, than even the struvite. Mm -hmm. um, in both these stones, we're going to see mostly miniature schnauzers, miniature poodles, the Lhasa opsos. Um, for the calcium oxalate, the risk factors are going to be increased calcium in the blood, acidic urine, uh, with both of them, if you have very concentrated urine, so the dog's not drinking a lot of water, mm -hmm. um, then that can be an issue for them. Um, and infrequent urination, so if they're not going out and urinating frequently and emptying the bladder, then you can get these uh, stones building up and problems. With the calcium oxalate, we'll also see it secondary to Cushing's disease yeah. or Addison's disease. And mm -hmm. obesity is also a risk factor for those dogs as well. Uh -huh. Another common, or common stone we'll see, about 6% of the dogs, are urate stones. Um, they've got a lot of different names, but these are most common in the Dalmatians. Hmm. We also see them in English Bulldogs and Russian Black Terrier. Hmm. Um, the other smaller breeds, the miniature Schnauzer, Shih Tzu's, and Yorkies also can have it, mainly because those dogs tend to have these congenital liver shunts that hmm. cause a buildup in the urea in the blood because the liver is not filtering the blood properly. Uh, so in the Dalmatians, it's a defect in the metabolism of purine and amino acid, mm -hmm. and that causes this to build up. They get a different byproduct of the metabolism than other dogs do. So we can see this secondary to these, these congenital issues and these hereditary conditions in the dogs, and they can be a problem. If we see a Dalmatian with a stone, we're going to think urate. <laughs> if we mm -hmm. see some of these little dogs, it could be any one of these. Yeah. Um, most of the time, they're going to come in because the owner saw blood in the urine. Mm -hmm. Or, like the cats, they may be straining to urinate. Especially the male dogs, they can get little tiny stones stuck in their urethra. Mm -hmm. um, they may be urinating in the house because, again, it's causing irritation and this urge to go. And it can actually cause a full-blown urine obstruction, just like in the cats. Uh, if that happens and that's an emergency situation, usually we can palpate the stone in the urethra and get that out. Yeah. Sometimes we have to flush it back into the bladder and then remove it surgically. On our exams, um, they're going to have a painful bladder most of the time. Mm -hmm. You can oftentimes palpate the stones in the bladder. Mm -hmm. I had one dog, I palpated the bladder, it felt like a bean bag. Mm -hmm. You could feel the stones crunching around in that bladder. Probably had about 30 or 40 stones in there. Um, we can also see blood staining around the urethral opening, so around mm -hmm. the rear end, around the, the prepuce there can give us an idea. And the bladder oftentimes is very enlarged because it's difficult for them to urinate completely. When they try and urinate, these stones may actually act as little valves and block the bladder. Mm -hmm. On our diagnosis, the most thing we're going to see on the x-rays, we're going to see these stones on an x-ray. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes an ultrasound may be more sensitive at picking up the smaller stones. So if we see something suspicious but we're not sure, we'll, we'll do that. Your analysis is often going to show signs of inflammation, um, changes in the pH. A little bit less uh, consistent is crystals in the urine. Okay. So sometimes you see the crystals of the type of stone that's forming in the urine. Yeah. So we can help diagnose it and maybe get an idea of what type of stone it is because that can affect how we're going to treat them. But we don't always see those. So mm -hmm. if we don't see them, we're kind of left with uh, having to go in and surgically remove those. So in the emergency cases where they have the urinary obstruction, we're going to relieve that obstruction mm -hmm. in the male dogs. It's just the, we can oftentimes, if we can palpate the stone underneath the skin where the urethra is, we'll just make an incision right over there and pop that stone out. Ooh. And then that'll heal up by itself without having too much, but they may urinate from a, a different hole for a little while. <laughs> kind of an interesting procedure. But uh, we do usually end up having to go into the bladder as well and removing all the rest of the stones so they don't continue to get blocked. Um, it's important to get these stones out not only because they're causing problems, but we want to analyze them and find out what type of stone they are. Mm -hmm. And in the struvite stones, it's a good idea to culture these stones too and find out what bacteria are associated with this and what antibiotics are going to be good for treating them. If we're having trouble um, getting, if we don't want to risk surgery, there's a couple other options. They're not used that often. One is called urohydropropulsion. This is where we put a catheter in, put some extra urine fluid into the, uh, not extra urine, extra <laughs> fluid into the bladder, and then we'll take that catheter out and then just squeeze the bladder and see if we can force those stones oh, out. That yeah. worked much better in the female dogs. Um, they can actually go in with, if they're small enough stones, with a cystoscope and retrieve them 
Huh. Just like they do with an the endoscope into the stomach. They can go in and get these small stones out. And then there's lithotripsy where they use sound waves to break up these stones. Yeah, those are fun. So if you don't want to, the animal's not a good risk for anesthesia. Um, there's some uh, referral places and universities that will have that equipment where they can either do external or they'll stick a, a catheter into the bladder and do it internally there. But if we have a struvite stone, which used to be the most common, it's still pretty common. There's actually a diet that can be given to dissolve these stones. Yep. So if we see struvite crystals in the urine and they got the bladder stone, but they're not obstructed, they seem to be doing okay, we might put them on the dissolution diets first. Yeah. So the Hills SD, the uh, Royal Canaan yeah. SO are the two big ones that we'll, we'll see to, pr to dissolve those stones. And usually within a few weeks to a month or two, those stones can just totally disappear. Mm -hmm. If they're not disappearing, that's probably not a struvite stone, or it can be a mixed stone. They're actually uh, combination stones that have struvite and calcium oxalate in it. Uh, in terms of prevention, if we have a dog that's at risk, has had already had a bladder stone, um, has a liver shunt, some of these other things, we want to promote water intake. We want to yeah. dilute the urine as much as possible, prevent those crystals from precipitating out and forming into those stones. Um, the prescription diets were indicated are very important um, for the dogs, the, uh, the Hills CD, uh, the Royal Canaan SO, um, and then for dogs, the Dalmatians that have these urate stones, they're not going to be dissolved by the diet. We can prevent them by using this uh, diet called UD, Hills UD. Hmm. And that can be very helpful for that. The Royal Canaan version is UC. UC. If there's an underlying problem like a shunt in one of the little Yorkies, or we're going to go in and recommend they get that surgically treated. We're going to deal with their Cushing's disease, their Addison's disease if that's present. Um, there's another medication we use quite often for the Dalmatians called allopurinol that can actually help prevent the uh, urates from showing up in the urine as well mm. and the formation of these stones. It doesn't work in all of them, but can be very effective for that. So bladder stones are not a simple problem in dogs. Mm -hmm. There's usually multiple causes, multiple reasons why they get them. But when we deal with treatment, it's usually they're going to recommend removing it to find out what that stone is. Yeah. If we do see some struvite crystals, we might try the diet before we go to surgery if the dog's stable enough mm -hmm. um, and re-x-ray them in a couple of weeks. But in most of these dogs, especially when we see multiple stones, we'll want to remove them. Mm -hmm. Or if we look at the x-ray and the stone looks a little spiky instead of a nice round smooth, that's probably not struvite. Yeah. Struvite ones are nice and smooth mm -hmm. and, and round, and, and you can just go by the breeds <laughs> a lot of times what you're seeing as well. Uh, I know my most interesting case, one of the doctors here, um, the dog was actually at a grooming facility and peed in the cage, uh -huh. and it was fresh blood. And so they're like, you know, we recommend you go to the doctors. The lady came in. We looked at the ultrasound, just stones fully in the bladder. Wow. So then we took an x-ray. It looked like one giant stone because that's how full her bladder was. By the time we did the surgery, we found out that there were a combination of stones, but there were so many stones, it was like sand in the bladder, and it just it was so gritty. But then there were still actual big smooth stones in there as well it just kept forming new yeah ones. it looked like you know someone had put a bunch of sand and pebbles in this poor dog's bladder and they had no idea if they hadn't yeah. seen the blood they, this is how it goes mm -hmm. i i have had dogs that they've actually peed out a stone yeah and the owners bring it in hey, my dog <laughs> passed this in its urine so that's really nice because then we can get it analyzed before exactly. we even have to without having to do surgery to decide maybe it's a struvite we can get rid of them all right, um, let's move on to the case of the week. Yeah. And uh, the case of the week is Chance this week. Chance is a, a dog with uh, one of these allergy dogs, the Atopy dogs. Yeah. that has got these skin allergies and secondary skin infections. And he'd been through a lot of treatments before, so we went ahead with the gold standard for which right now is a shot of Convenia, which is a skin antibiotic that's mm -hmm. injectable. So one shot lasts two weeks. It's yeah. very good. It clear, starts clearing up the skin within 12 to 24 hours. Oh, wow. And then we he's been on the um, Cytopoint, the allergy injection, to help block that interleukin that causes the itching that mm -hmm. leads to these skin infections. And we're also having him use this Biohex shampoo, which has the uh, molecules in it to help regenerate the proper skin barrier. Yeah. Because atopy occurs because of... Uh, defects in the skin barrier that allow proteins, allergens to get in, and the bacteria to get in and cause these infections. So unless you are treating the secondary infection they get because of the itching, treating the itching itself and repairing the thing, you're not going to get good control. Mm -hmm. So that's why it frustrates a lot of people um, when they're dealing with these and they maybe try some steroids or some antihistamines and some oral antibiotics and they're just not going to have a good response. Right. Yeah. You really have to go full full blown here uh, with the, the, the best medications here to get these under control. And when you do, it's a lot easier to keep them under control. Mm -hmm. 
uh, just that cytopoint injection every six to eight weeks um, and the bathing as regularly as you can to make sure you're regenerating that skin barrier and keeping those infections under control. So if you have a dog that has recurrent skin infections, ask your vet about these products because they're really good for getting it under control and keeping it under control mm -hmm. and improving the quality of their life. One of the things they noticed on the dog was he was starting to get some dark areas on the skin on the belly where the skin infections had been. Yeah. And that's just hyperpigmentation from the chronic irritation that he's had. It doesn't yeah. necessarily mean that he still has an infection. And that can fade over time, but it's not unusual for that to be kind of a permanent thing yeah, going forward. Yeah, unfortunately we do see that commonly with our allergy pets. All right, this uh, week for Tech Tips, Brittany, since we're talking about urinary things mm -hmm. last week, I wanted to talk about how to get a urine sample yep. and then keep it clean and sterile before people bring it in to the clinic mm -hmm. uh, if your dog has a problem. Because yep. a lot of times what happens is the dog comes in and they want to pee so bad, they pee right before they come into the clinic, and I can't get any urine at all. Yes. Yeah. Um, so that is a frequent problem for us. But a lot of times, we do have some good owners who are really good at this. Um, so usually, when we're trying to, when we recommend getting urine from a dog, most owners are like, well, how am I supposed to do that? Well, you take them outside because <laughs> when they're having a lot of issues, they are asking frequently to go outside. Right. Usually, we do recommend like the first sample of the day, especially if you're going to catch it yourself. Um, and then just find something, A, that is clean, um, so not a dirty cup or yeah, something like that. Run it through the dishwasher if you're not sure. Mm -hmm. That'll help sterilize it, too. Exactly. Or, and then be something you don't want back. Um, you'd <laughs> yeah. be surprised how many owners send us with a good container or a bowl, and they're like, oh, mm -hmm. I want it back. Um, and we're just like, oh, why? Um, but just something that you don't plan on really yeah. getting back. Um, and then usually for male dogs, it's a lot easier um, because a lot of times they do like to mark. And they're standing. Um, mm -hmm, they're it standing so up. A lot easier. of times they lift that leg up. It's usually a, a little easier. A lot of times it is hard when they're constantly going, especially when they're straining, um, because you can some. It can be frustrating. You know, you can only get one or two drops, so you have yeah. to constantly keep trying to take them out or constantly keep trying to catch it. Right. Um, but the biggest thing is just trying to be right underneath that stream. Um, usually, I do recommend wearing gloves. Um, especially if it's like a windy day or something. Mm -hmm. This is what we learned from experience here. Um, you are going to get blowback. Um, so make sure <laughs> oh, you have, you know, gloves on or something. And then, you know, um, whatever you're using, try to make sure it's a good width or length. Um, you know, especially if you have dogs that are easily spooked. Um, when we were doing a free catch here, we have nice long trays that are like maybe a foot long. And so, like, we can get underneath the dog without being completely on top of them or completely underneath them, especially because, you know, most of these dogs don't know us. They're easily spooked, but they still need to urinate, yeah. so they want to go. Um, but just something to keep them comfortable and that, you know, they're not going to run away and keep peeing and then that you lost your chance to get that urine sample. Um, for female dogs, it's a little trickier because they squat and go. Um, for female dogs, you definitely want something a little thinner that you're going to have to slide underneath them mm -hmm. um, just because, again, you're going to have that ground and then you're going to have their rear end right there. Right. Um, and if you tap them, especially, again, if you have an easily spooked dog, they're just going to get up and walk away. Um, you know, there is a chance that they're going to start urinating again once they get away from you. But once they know what you're trying to do, they're going to keep trying to walk away from you because no. you're going to keep tapping them and, you know, yes. you keep tapping me. I don't want to be next yes. to you when I have to go to the bathroom. So a lot of times we try to be fast about it, but at the same time, you know, you got to be stealthy because you don't want to spook them. Stealthy. Like <laughs> um but again, you want to be careful when sliding it underneath the ground. A lot of times when you're trying to slide underneath the ground with your tray or with your mm -hmm. bowl or whatever, you're going to hit the ground sometimes. And if you do that, especially with a female dog crouching down, in your mind you're getting it, but you could just be leaning against like just a little hump on the ground and then you go to pull the tray back and there's no pee there. Yeah. And there's, you know, a dog has peed and she's walked away and... You know, unlike a male dog, she's probably not going to squat again because yeah. she's happy and you won't be able to get it again until a few hours later. Um, so, you know, timing, being stealthy again, and, you know, just clean uh, clean Tupperware or whatever you're going to use, trays, whatever, to catch it. And then when you're storing the urine, you know, if you get it the night before or the morning and you know your appointment's not until a few hours, um, put it in, in something, you know, airtight. 
and right. then refrigerating it yeah. um, is usually the best. We don't want to leave it sitting out because bacteria can grow, especially as it if it's still mm-hmm. warm. Um, so put it in a refrigerator, especially if it is only going to be for an hour or so, it's fine. One of the things people can do, ask your veterinarian for a syringe without a needle mm-hmm. and just suck it into that. And uh, that way that'll keep it relatively clean Mm -hmm. less less chance of contamination yep yep and then yeah if you know your pet has a urinary issue you can always ask your vets um a lot of them has uh have urinary go home collection kits we do we send you home especially for dogs we'll send you home with the clean tray um, some yeah. gloves, a pipette. So for most people, like a turkey baster. So um, tiny they, one. Yeah, a little, little tiny itty one. bitty tiny one yeah. that you can suck up that urine. And then we'll send you home with the tube that usually we use in the hospital to hold the urine. Um, for cats, it is kind of hard to collect urine for a cat, um, especially at home. But a lot of times, you know, if we have shy cats that, you know, either have accidents in the mm-hmm. um, the carrier on the way here or just will not go while they're here, we'll send home something called Nozorb. Um, and it's pretty much like kitty litter, but they're little plastic pellets, right. and they just won't absorb the urine. So we recommend owners switching out their litter and putting this Nozorb in a litter box so the cat can still go. Um, making sure you clean the litter box before you switch it out yeah. so it can have a clean box. And then, again, you're just going in with your pipette and just sucking up that urine that you can and putting it in that tube so you can bring it back to the clinic. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually, you know, for cats, it's not going to be that easy because some cats, if they see no Zorb, they're like, this isn't my litter. I'm going to go pee on a shoe or something. Um, But, you know, if that's easier for most owners, instead of leaving a cat here, that works as well. There's another kit that I've seen that they they offer, and it's it's a sandy litter, but instead of letting the urine pass through it and you collect it that way, the urine beads up on top. Huh. So when the cat pees on this litter, it forms a little puddle on top that then you can just suck the urine off and get a sample that way. Huh. It's a lot more expensive than a nose orb, but it might be better for some cats and then you don't have to worry about it getting contaminated in I there. don't see the cat stepping in it, though. Well, yeah. I mean, there's all sorts if of problems with either one of them. That, yeah. But, uh, you know, if you get them to, to uh, usually what will happen, it'll just flow to the lowest part and then okay. you get, you're there and you're ready to go. Um, I've used it on a couple of cases because I got some samples of it and it worked okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But... There's really no no easy way to do it. Yeah. I, one of the things I'm going to tell people, if you can't get the sample, don't let your dog pee when they're going right into the veterinary's clinic. Yeah. Let them have that full bladder and let us get the sample. Yeah. Especially for smaller dogs. If you can carry them in, yeah. that's usually the best case scenario. Um, we've even had owners give us a call when they're around the corner just so we are prepared to go out, mm-hmm. especially for like a big lab. We're prepared to run out with two or three people and carry them back in a clinic mm-hmm. really quickly so we can get that sample. Or as soon as you get out the car we're prepared with our tray and everything so we can get some urine um because that's kind of the most frustrating thing for owners you know right. that have to keep coming back and forth with your dog who you know is going to keep peeing and mm-hmm. you know we can only fix so much when we don't know what we're fixing um right and one of the other things i want to mention when you collect urine yourself there's a couple of things that can happen while you're waiting to get the urine sample to the, the hospital mm-hmm. one if you got any contamination in there we might look at that urine and say oh there's lots of bacteria in there yeah but it might not mean your dog had a, a urinary tract infection just that it got contaminated mm-hmm. so that's why you want to make sure you use a clean right tray and bowl. there's there's been cases where urine has been sitting around for a few hours you'll actually get these struvite crystals precipitate in the urine mm-hmm. even though they don't have them in their bladder yeah so if we see the struvite crystals or we see a bacterial infection, we may want to re- re-get another sample just to be sure mm-hmm. uh, in the clinic. But if it's negative, then we can know that it's negative. Mm-hmm. Well, and then a lot of times with free catch uh, urines as well, we can get a negative or a positive or false positive just yeah. because you have to think there's bacteria on the skin and on their fur, especially right. if you have these really fluffy dogs, um, especially those males when they have that schmegma on it's up and if they pee through that there's bacteria in there yeah. um so you're going to get more of a contaminated sample than you would if we directly go from the bladder yes. like we usually like to do um because that's more of a sterile sample um but if free catch is our only option for most of these pets you know we just try yeah. to do it as sterile as possible right yeah it's okay um next week uh we're going to talk about mammary tumors yeah. in pets and uh, the reason I want to talk about that, we just had a dog in this morning with a mm-hmm. mammary tumor. This is actually the third time we've taken one off of her. Yeah. This is one of the reasons why we recommend early spaying and neutering. Mm-hmm. But 
even spayed and neutered pets can get these mammary tumors. Yeah. And if they do get them, we want people to know what to expect when that happens. Yeah. Uh, there's a wide range of things that can happen, so we'll go over that in detail next time. Mm -hmm. uh, as always, I want to remind people, if you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe. Mm -hmm. And make sure you click on the notification bell. And if you're listening to us on your favorite podcasting service, make sure you're following us so that you get the notifications when we put the new episodes up. So you don't miss an episode of the Pet Pack. Yep. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. We'll see you next time.